be joined by Khalilat the Sheikh Dr. Tahir Wyatt. Uh, blessed to have him back. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Of course, we benefited greatly from uh, his uh, segments in Quran 30 for 30 during the month of Ramadan. And Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I think that everyone um, really found great benefit in the khutbah that you gave last Friday, Sheikh, addressing the mm-hmm. situation. Allah yitqabal minnak, Ya Rabb. May Allah Azza accept it and, and uh, continue to guide your heart and guide your tongue. Amen. And uh, make you a source of guidance for all of us. Allahumma ameen. ameen. Of course, we have uh, Sheikh and Sheikh Abdullah Aduru as well. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, with us, uh, Sheikh Abdullah, it's good to, good to have you as always. Alhamdulillah. And uh, we, have a, we have a great selection today, honestly. SubhanAllah. It's, it comes before uh, probably some of the most frequently recited verses of the Quran uh, about the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But uh, there is a passage that comes before that that really sets it up so beautifully and I think helps us understand it. So inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Tahir Wyatt to start us off inshallah uh, with uh, a framework uh, based on these ayat inshallah ta'ala for tonight. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa liyus salihin wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu ba'adhu allahu rahmatan lil alameen Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik wa anam ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'ad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says towards the end of surah al-hashr as you said these these ayat that are oft recited in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu taqullah يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله الله سبحانه وتعالى here is commanding us with taqwa he says O oh, you who have iman اتقوا الله and taqwa is often translated as uh, God consciousness um, I was talking with somebody the other day about how we used to translate it as the fear of Allah and we honestly we moved away from that because a lot of people um, don't really understand the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a broader framework of fear being a motivating factor to avoid those things which would displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, in any event, it is that reverent fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, makes us conscious of him at all times, have taqwa of Allah. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we're coming out of the month of Taqwa, the month of Ramadan, the month where we reminded to uh, that the goal, in fact, of fasting, that the higher objective of fasting is to attain Taqwa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying, Ya ayyuh ladina amanu taqullah. Then he says, Wal tamdhu nafsu ma qaddamat li ghadin. And let every soul look to what it has put forth for tomorrow. Let each one of us be conscious of our actions and what it is that we are putting forth for the hereafter. And then Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us again, what taqwa, right? So sandwiched in between taqwa, right? These, these commands of taqwa is that we are conscious of what we are putting forth for tomorrow and that we look to that. And this as uh, Al-Imam Abdurrahman bin Nasr al-Si'di rahimahullah ta'ala says is هذه الآية الكريمة he says that this noble ayah أصل في المحاسبة أو في محاسبة النفس that it is the foundation it is a it is the a primary proof for the obligation of محاسبة النفس and that we take account of ourselves uh, literally you know we could say doing a self audit right so when a person has a company and you do your books and somebody else comes in and they audit you know they, they they're looking at every little thing you know where, where this uh, dollar came in and where that dollar went out right so there, there's this process of auditing and muhasaba to nafs is the process of auditing yourself taking account of yourself doing your self examination and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us to do this uh, in this ayah, wal tamdur nafsu ma qaddamat li ghadin. Wal tamdur obviously is the command form of the verb. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us to look forth to what we have, uh, or to, to look to what we have put forth for tomorrow. Th- that being said, there are several, uh, I mean, this theme throughout the Quran is, is um, prevalent. And in the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam, as well, there's an oft uh, mentioned hadith. And though the hadith has some weakness in it, the, the meaning is accepted across the board. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Kayyisu 
من دان نفسه الكيس من دان نفسه وعمل لما بعد الموت the intelligent one is the one who takes account of himself دان نفسه means يعني حاسب نفسه so he takes account of himself he he does a self examination وعمل لما بعد الموت and he works uh, for that which is after death uh, in other words, that his focus is on the hereafter, his focus is on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, in that same regard is the, is the famous statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which comes in the Kitab uh, al-Zuhd by Imam Ahmed. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasibu. Take account of yourselves. Take account of yourselves before the day comes when you will be taken account of. Wazinu a'malakum qabla and tuzanu. And weigh your deeds before the day comes when they will be weighed. And if we really think about this, this uh, advice from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala, and it was profound. Because he's reminding us that the day will come, subhanAllah, no matter how long you think that day is going to be away from you right now, subhanAllah, sometimes like, it's like a person, they know they have to take a test. The test might be two months away. If you know that that test is two months away, don't wait for the night before to start preparing, right? There's, you, you have to go to class, you're gonna study, you're going to, you know, read outside because you're preparing for that test. Well, you know that the day, is going to come when you have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for hasibu anfusakum. So take account of yourselves before the day comes when you will be taken account of. The Prophet said in a very famous hadith that awwal ma yuhasabu al abdu alayhi yawm al qiyama min amalihi salatuhu. That the first thing that a person will be held accountable for uh, on the day of judgment from his actions is salat, right? In other words, and the Prophet said, said, you have يعني, that you, that, that the, an abd, يعني, that the servant of Allah SWT will be held accountable for this and he will have to answer for that. You have يعني, it's going to be taken to account. And so a person should take account of himself before the day comes when he will be taken account of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala says on this account that the intelligent person or the one who will have a light account on that day will be the one who takes a lot of, uh, does a lot of self-examination in this life. So it'll be easier for him in the next life. And the one who doesn't do any of that in this life, yushaku uh, and yuhlak, he's going to put himself in a, or subject himself to destruction. That being said, there's a lot that can be said on this topic of muhasaba, and I, I don't want to go too far on you know, laying the foundation, but I, I do think that it's very important for us. A lot of times when we think about ibadah, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is salat or fasting or hajj and umrah, and, and we, we oftentimes neglect what we call al-ibadat al-qalbiya, so the, the, the worship of the heart, right? Tawbah, for example, you know, true repentance, feeling remorse for what you've done and, and having that firm determination not to turn back to it. That is an act of the heart and it's an act of ibadah that's beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At tawakkul, loving Allah, uh, putting, it, put it, putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and relying upon Him. All of these are acts that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are actions of the heart. Muhasaba is similar in this sense. This uh, self-examination is not something you're going to do with your hands or your limbs. It's something that is a, an action of the heart and it's very important that we, that we give it its due. Uh, one of the early uh, tabi'een, Maymoon ibn Mihran, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was actually from the students of Ibn Abbas and Ibn Omar and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een. He said a very famous uh, statement related to muhasaba and I, I think it puts things in context uh, he says that a person will not be a taqi. We won't attain taqwa, right? He says you will not become a taqi. Hatta yakuna li nafsihi ashadda muhasabatan min ash-shariq li shariqihi. Yani he won't become a person of taqwa until he is, is to himself more severe in overlooking uh, or, or, or that oversight, making sure that things are done right 
that he does this to himself more than a business partner would do to his business partner. And that is why they said, nafsu kashirik al khawan right? That the, the soul, that the self, if you will, is like a deceitful business partner, right? He's your business partner, but he cheats you sometimes. If you don't take account of him, if you don't watch him, he's going to run away with your money. And so the same thing can be said about the soul. If we're, if we're not conscious and we're not looking at our actions, then it is very possible that, or very likely, in fact, that the nafs al amara bisu, that that part of ourselves that is whispering to us to do bad things is going to take over. So with that being said, I want to lay out uh, some framework for how do we do this muhasaba? Because a lot of times we hear, okay, yeah, you're supposed to take account of yourself. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean like I sit in a dark room or I turn on a little light and then I start thinking about what I did during the day? Or what, what, how does that work? And so, inshallah ta'ala, I'd like to lay out some framework uh, that will help us, inshallah ta'ala, on this path of muhasaba. And this comes directly from Iratatul Lahfan by Ibn al Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, which is a very uh, famous book um, dealing with the subject of, uh, well, it, it deals with a lot of the amrad al qalbiyya and the, the, the disease of the heart and also the ibadat of the heart. And so when he talks about muhasaba, he says that muhasaba is two broad types, all right? So this is the first thing that we want to look at. The one is muhasaba ma qabla al-amal. So taking account before you even do an action. And then the second broad category is after the action is done. So these are two categories. Before you even sit down, before you even do anything, you want to take account of yourself. All right. So then he goes on and he breaks that down into four more categories, all right? And so what you look at here is uh, number one, this action that you are intending to do. So he says that you stop at, your, at the first time that you're thinking about doing this, this, amal, this, this action. The first time that you're desiring to do it, you stop there and you ask yourself, is this action within my ability? So that's the first question. Is this action within my ability to do and reasonably, right? And this is very important for us to look at. A lot of us sometimes, um, you know, we, we may have a desire to do very grandiose things, but they may be with, outside of our ability. And, and the reason why Ibn al-Qayyim is talking about this is because you don't want to get frustrated in your ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in any of your actions to the point that you stop doing them. Okay, because this is also not something that is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here we go. First thing you do, you look at, is it in, you know, within my reasonable, reasonable ability to get this done? If the answer is yes, then the second question that you have to ask yourself is, is doing this action better for me than leaving it off? So a lot of times, yes, I can do it. But should I do it is the better question here after mm -hmm. I determine that I can do it. So is it better for me to actually do this thing or is it better for me to leave it off? If your answer to that question is yes, this this act of ibadah or this act in general is better for me to do it. Then your third question that you ask yourself is what is my motivation for doing it? And this is where the whole concept of ikhlas comes in. Is Am I motivated to do this action solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking his reward? Or is there something else motivating me? Am I seeking thanks from people? Am I seeking that they praise me uh, for the action that I'm doing? Am I looking for validation from, it, from an external source, uh, for example? So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala says, that we have to look at all of these things. Am I looking for a financial kickback? And this is also something that Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned. So this should be an act that is done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I'm, you know, a person is only doing it for uh, some financial gain. And uh, here we have to stop because you don't want to get used to doing things for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The easier it becomes for you to do things for other than Allah, the more difficult it will be for you to do things solely for Allah. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to get in the habit, period. And I mean, this is even outside of ibadah. 
like even mundane things um, that, that you might do. OK, and, I, and I'll just take a side note here. For example, you know, uh, uh, you might cook a meal for your wife. Right. Are you doing that just because you, you messed up and you're trying to get back in her good graces? Or are you doing that because you want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing things that are pleasing to his creation? For example, I mean, it's just something to think about, meaning that we want to try to get to the point where everything that we do is for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, when it comes to ibadat that are only supposed to be solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is not permissible to do that for other than Allah azza wa jalla. So our third question then is, what is my motivation? And then the last question is, so once, my, once I've determined that I can do this uh, action um, and I should do this action and it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the fourth question that I'm asking myself is, do I have the necessary help? Do I have the necessary resources to complete the action? Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala here is specifically uh, referring to the human resources. Yani, hal al mar mu'anun alayh. And he doesn't have the help that is necessary to do this particular action. And so he gives us the example of the Prophet والسلام, in Mecca. He says, if, if you don't have the people that are necessary to, and, and, the, and the helpers that are necessary to complete that action that would be solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though you may be able to do it yourself, you, you know, you may be able to do this action by yourself, but it's not going to reach the, the conclusion that you are, are looking for. He says, then you fall back, then you stop. The same way that the Prophet uh, did not engage in jihad in Mecca uh, because the numbers simply were not there. Okay, uh, so this is something that uh, uh, a person, uh, you know, this is the framework that Ibn al-Qayyim uses before an action. And this is how we, we look at it. So again, uh, he says, you look at, is it possible? Is it best to do? Is it done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone? And do you have the necessary resources to, to complete the action? Uh, moving to what is after the action, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala uh, goes on to say, that after you have done an action, you're going to look at several areas. And the first of them is, and, and he said, he, he almost, you know, he lays this out as, as mu'ataba. Like in other words, like um, you're being very critical of yourself. And, and um, I hope that Sheikh Omar, maybe, you know, um, one of our mental health professionals can perhaps talk a little bit about this in the future. Uh, we don't want to be so self-critical that we become self-defeating, right? Um, that you're so critical of your actions that you just stop doing actions, right? Because this is also, like, for example, a person um, is scared to, you know, or they, they feel like maybe I'm doing this uh, to show off. You know, I'm doing this out of react, so I'm just not going to do anything. Uh, we don't want to get to that point either. But what he's saying is that after you do an action, you do want to be critical of yourself. And so you look at the following things. Number one, you look at your level of ikhlas, okay? Because ikhlas is also levels, right? And so how sincere were you in this action for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Was it purely for him? Did something creep in? And if something did creep in, how do you make sure that that doesn't happen in the future? You want to look at your nasiha lillah. And this is a little bit different from sincerity. This is the, the, the word nasiha, which is often translated as, as advice, obviously doesn't mean that as it relates to the haqq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the better translation for nasiha in general is fidelity, that you are true to something. Um, and so as in like, you know, infidelity is when a person in a relationship is not being true to their partner, right? So that fidelity, that it is totally, you know, you know, done for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from start to finish. You, you want to look at also what he says, mutaba'atu ar-rasuli sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in this action that I've done, have I done my best to do it the way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prescribed for me to do it? And this is a lot of times where we fall short. We get accustomed to doing things a certain way. We watch somebody else do something a certain way, 
But are we truly aware of the Sunnah of the Prophet as it relates to this particular action? And that is very important because it's not enough that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to worship Allah the way that he prescribed that we worship him. And this is very important. And this is one of the things that has historically distinguished Ahl Sunnah from those who leave the path of Ahl Sunnah is that they're very keen on worshiping Allah the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed for himself to be worshipped. After that, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions shuhud al-ihsan. Uh, in other words, um, have, you, have you done your best in this action, okay? Uh, ha have, you, have you reached the level of ihsan in this act that you have performed, right? And, and that's important too because, and then that's tied directly to what comes after it. And he says, shuhud al-taqseer, right? Which is to also recognize your shortcoming in whatever act of ibadah that you've done. Uh, right after salat immediately after you do salam, astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah for what? Because, because you just did something wrong? I mean, you just prayed. Astaghfirullah, because you always need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, number one, and number two, because you yourself recognize that even in that salat, as short as it was, there were some shortcomings. You know, perhaps you weren't totally, you know, uh, mindful the entire salat, or perhaps there were some things that you could have done better that you didn't do. So recognizing your own faults and shortcomings uh, in whatever action it is. And then he says, وَشُهُودِ shukr," And he witnessing the, the gratitude. In other words, that we are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having guided us to those acts of ibadah that we've done. And these are, and these are as it relates to acts of ibadah. Uh, if it is something that is haram, and Ibn al-Qayyim has a different framework that he uses for, you know, how we do muhasabah to nafs. And that is where a person is going to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, repent to him. Uh, literally, tawbah, right, means to turn around. So, so we're turning, we're changing our ways, we're turning from uh, that act of disobedience and turning to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being critical in that way. And looking at, and this is very important when it comes to acts of disobedience, don't just look at the act itself look at what led up to the act because you have to if, if you want to stop any act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have to be able to stop the roads that lead to that disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala avoid the situations the conditions the scenarios that put you in that environment that made it easy for you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so these are things that that you look at after an action you take account of yourself I'll give one example and then I'll finish here because I know I've taken a lot of time but the, the example that I'm going to give is the example of Salat right uh, when it comes to uh, for example a person who misses Salat al-Fajr and then he says to himself well what is it that caused me to miss Salat al-Fajr it's not that I, it's not just that the person missed Salat al-Fajr that's not you know that is a sin but what is it uh, it was that I stayed up late you know, with my friends the night before and I did not get enough sleep. Okay, if that is the case, then a person who is truly, you know, repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to realize the next time that I can't stay out that late with my friends. So you're actually thinking in advance, right? So here we go again. Your friends call you, they say, hey, you know, we, we, we want to go, uh, we, we're going to, um, we're going to hang out together. We're going to read a book together. It's going to be nice. It's going to be full of ibadah and so on and so forth. But then he starts thinking. So he says, can I do this action? All right? He says, yes, I can do it. Number two, should I do this action? Hmm. When he starts to think about should I do it, and then he thinks that, wait a minute, if I do this, though it may seem like it's a good thing, it's not really good for me because I need this amount of sleep to be able to get up for Salat al-Fajr. And so then he stops right there. He doesn't even get past that point because he realized, realizes that leaving it off is actually better than doing it. Anyway, this is the framework that was provided by Ibn al-Qayyim. This topic of muhasaba is one that needs a lot of reflection. Uh, one lecture is not enough, but hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, uh, there's some benefit in what was said. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa
You just signed up for uh, part two. You realize that, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's necessary. When you say it's not enough for one lecture, and then you say, you know, there's more. Yeah, yeah subhanAllah. Barak very, Barak very beneficial, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. So, Sheikh Abdullah, I'll hand it off to you, inshallah, with some thoughts from your end. Jazakallah khair. MashaAllah. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walah. Rabbi shrahi sadri wa yasili amri. Uh, for the beautiful reminder on muhasaba and uh, holding oneself accountable. And uh, what I want to touch on is within this general framework of muhasaba, if it's a certain aspect of muhasaba, when we talk about, you know, the word dhikr, and dhikr is a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the manifestation of that remembrance is obviously with the qalb, is with the heart. That one remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their hearts and they remember him by mentioning his name, which rejuvenates that feeling. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives different forms of dhikr in the Quran, he reminds you of the past, reminds you of the present, reminds you of, of the afterlife. You know, what is going on in the afterlife, what will happen in the future. And subhanAllah, you know, we know the general theme of the Quran is the worship of Allah and the recognition of Allah Ta'ala, who he is, who he is not, and how one manifests that in their life. And subhanAllah, when we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most important right is giving Allah his right. You know, as I give my, my parents their rights, I give my friends his rights, I give plants their rights, animals their rights. But the most important right is the right of the one that made you, your creator. And that's saying that he is not anything like his human being, not like a human being. He's not like his creation in any shape, form, or fashion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us many opportunities to understand that, to grasp that, and to try our level best to uh, uh, exemplify that within our life on a daily basis. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we know as human beings, when we go to work, or when we have any system in our household, if we want them to do something, we will say, okay, if you do this, you receive a reward. And if you do the opposite, there is some, we don't say punishment, we would say accountability. You will be held accountable for that which you are negligent of, and you will be held accountable as well, being rewarded for that which you have fulfilled. So in the chapter of Fusilat, verse number 19 to verse number 24, chapter number 41, Fusilat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the future, or he talks about what will happen to those that openly and voluntarily deny him, meaning they, they deny the oneness of Allah within their actions, initially the actions of the heart, which is the actions of Tawheed, the actions of saying that God is one by himself. One that dies upon that and, 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 and totally understands that message, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the level of accountability here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's so beautiful is when he says in the chapter of Fusilat here before it, he talks about the tribe of, or the people of Ad and Thamud, you know, the people that denied the message from their prophets and they were arrogant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, they were, arrogant, they were arrogant on the earth. And they said, Who is more stronger than us? Who has more might than us? And Allah subhanahu wa said, Who is more stronger than us? Who has more might than us? Did they not see? Rhetorical question. Did they not see? That Allah has more might than them. That he has, he has much more strength than them. And they were with our verses very defiant. Then Allah mentions that that we sent upon them a harsh wind. And, and in harsh days. And some scholars mention that the sound of the wind was like metal rubbing against uh, rocks. And some say it was seven days continuous without any stopping. In any case, Allah creates, creates this, gives this premise to give you examples of those that disbelieved and died upon that disbelief, that ungratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, uh, when he starts off in this verse number 19, as you know, Shaykh Tahir mentioned, the chapter of Hashr, which means to be gathered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off in verse number 19, bringing the new subject matter of the event that actually takes place. And it's important for us to remember the beauty of the Quran that Allah generalizes due to his ilm and hikmah, due to his knowledge, al-alim, and his wisdom, al-hakim. 
He generalizes that and those generalizations may give us space to exemplify and act out whatever ruling it may be. But in some cases, he's very specific to remind you of the severity of the situation at hand. And here the severity is showing lack of gratitude to the one that has made you, created you, sustains you, and as well takes you off of this earth by his permission, subhanahu. He says, And the day that the enemies of Allah will be gathered and they will be spread out. What's beautiful here is how Allah uses the passive tense of the verb. And just the fact that it is used in a passive tense shows that he has ultimate authority. The day, firstly, the day when they will be gathered, the enemies of Allah, that is the day of Yom al Qiyamah. That they will be gathered, the enemies of Allah will be gathered, and they will be spread out. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to mention here, Hatta ida maja'uha shahida alayhim sam'uhum wa abusaruhum wa juluduhum bima kanu ya'manum. And this is where it gets really uh, scary. Uh, the one that holds themselves accountable reads this verse, and they immediately don't look at anyone else. They immediately have a recollection upon themselves. As the Sheikh mentioned, you know, the, the, the stages of muhasaba from Ibn Qayyim, Hafidullah rahimahullah ta'ala, that one holds themselves accountable when they read this verse. Because he says here that when they will be gathered, hatta idha ja'uha, that when Allah SWT mentions that they will be gathered and they will be spread out in front of the fire, ila nari fuhum yuza'un. Then Allah says, hatta idha ma ja'uha, until when they come to it, the fire, shahida alayhim samarun, that their hearing, their hearing, the senses of their hearing will witness against them. Wa abusaruhum, and their sight, wa juluduhum, and their skin will testify against them. And what? Bima kan wiyamanu, for what they used to do. You know how sometimes if you, you tell someone, you know, I'm not afraid of fire. Many of us, may, as, as youth, we probably challenged our friends something. And as soon as the situation comes forth, comes in front of them, they're like, okay, 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 just relax, right? All right, I'm not going to do it. It's, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Sorry, right? You know, the real you comes out. So Allah is painting a picture for you that when they're spread amongst the fire and then when they come to it, their own, your own body parts will witness against you. And what's so beautiful here is that he mentions two senses and then an organ, which is actually the largest organ of the body, that it will witness against you for what you used to do. Just stopping here, one should look at this first and at least tremble with fear, at least tremble with some kind of mindfulness. As Sheikh Tahir mentioned, the meaning of taqwa is that you know we have this mindfulness which leads to all the other exemplifications of ibadah, fear, love, honor, etc. And that serves as a means and a protection from doing something that which is detrimental to your soul, right? So when looking here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these body parts will witness against them for what they used to do. Then Allah brings you the actual statement. And they, the inhabitants of these senses and organs of the skin, you and I, inshallah, we will not be from those people, that Allah says that they will say, they're speaking to their own body parts. As subhanAllah, some of the scholars of you know the fuqaha mentioned the impermissibility of selling your body parts and their illa wara'adhalika, their illa for their reasoning behind their legislation of impermissibility is because look, you don't even own your own body parts. You're not the ultimate owner of your own body parts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to you temporarily and he can easily take it away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that they will ask their body parts, why did you witness against us? That the body parts will say, our own Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us speak. And then he reminds himself, the body parts remind him, the one that causes everything to speak, reminding you that he has ultimate authority. And then he reminds you again, reminding all of us, the listeners and the readers, 
وهو خلقكم أول مرة وإليه ترجعون سبحان الله الله مستعان and then he says here that he is the one that has created you from the very beginning and to him you will return just reminding you that you have no ultimate ultimate authority and control which should leave one uncertain of their own existence and uncertain of what will happen to them in the next life just think about that we already know that we don't know when we're going to die so we should hold ourselves accountable during this life when reading or hearing these types of verses and we do not know what will happen to us after we die so we should hold ourselves accountable during this life to hopefully when we go where we go that it is a place that it is not as such it is not to where we will stand in front of the fire and we will be held accountable then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَطِرُونَ أَنْ يَشْهَدَ عَلَيْكُمْ سَمْعُكُمْ وَلَا أَبْصَارُكُمْ وَلَا جُلُودُكُمْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And you have not been hiding your, against yourselves, lest your ears, your eyes, and your skins testify against you. That all of this that is taking place, were you not aware that it is your body parts that will testify against you? One should automatically look at themselves, you know, look at their hands, and look at what they're doing, and be aware that, you will be asked about these senses. How did you use them? You will be asked about this skin. How did you use it? You are the dweller inside of this largest organ of your body, your skin. What are you doing that shows gratitude to the one that has given it to you? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to say here, <clears throat> that you thought that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not aware of all of what you do. And remember, he mentions here earlier that you think that you're not aware that Allah is not aware of what you're doing on this earth. Allah gives you this small example of something that we cannot fathom. Your own body parts testify against you. You know, well, I'm my way here to Houston. I'm looking and I'm seeing I'm blinking. You know, I'm asking myself, am I getting old? Is there something wrong with my left eye? And I'm saying to myself, you know what? I don't even have control over my own eyes. If something was to happen, I would go to the ophthalmologist, the optometrist, hoping that they can help me. And that shows that I have no ultimate control relying on someone else's knowledge that is also limited. The one that is not limited is shown his strength and power, being that he has created you and he has given you these faculties. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating that, 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 means of remembrance for you to understand that you have no ultimate control to where your own body parts will witness against you and what you used to do. And he's reminding you, do not be negligent on this earth by thinking that Allah is not aware of what you do with these body parts. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to say, that these thoughts, that these thoughts of yours, which you thought about Allah, has brought you to your own destruction. This type of understanding that you had about your creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking that he will not see you, that a samir will not hear you, or being negligent to the degree to where that action of yours is consistent, could be the means to your own destruction. And this is why we say, subhanAllah, that you are your worst enemy. That when you answer to the call of those desires by looking on the computer, online or offline, on things that you know you shouldn't be looking at, and you continue, you answer the call. You don't take those steps of muhasaba. You don't ask yourself, okay, if I do this, what most likely would that lead to? Being responsible for your akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unaware of that. That is what was the means to your own destruction, and that was, subhanAllah, you have become on this day those who have utterly lost. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the last verse, Then if it is, if they have patience, yet the fire will be a home for them if they beg to be excused. Because what will happen is, which shows this is a proof of the Allah's qadr, that uh, they will ask to be excused. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, And if they were to, not if uh, if they were to beg to be excused, basically if they were to ask or to 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 admonish what they have done, 
being excused. They are really not of those that do mu'atiba upon themselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being that he is the creator, the sustainer, the maintainer, the one that has all knowledge of all of these things, he is well aware and he is reminding you when one reads these verses, one should immediately upon reading these verses in this subject matter of verse number 19 to verse number 24, a verse that makes one tremble, that they should say, oh Allah, please do not make me of those individuals. Oh Allah, please make me of the ones that believe in you and understand your greatness to where our skin and Allah mentions in different verses that they will be at and be asked about what they have done in this life. So that is a beautiful reminder that I want to, a beautiful, beautiful verses that I want to remind all of us start, starting with myself that there will be a day that the unfathomable will happen. And there are many other examples here. And this is just one small example to where we hold ourselves accountable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that hold ourselves accountable in this life to where we will face the joy and salam in the next. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. And we've, we're, we're, we've gone a lot longer tonight, but inshallah ta'ala, it's a benefit to everyone. So forgive us for the... Uh, we're going a little bit longer, um, you know, and I'll just add just a few thoughts, you know, bringing it all back. It's from the mercy of Allah that he gives us these scenes so that we don't become the primary actors within them. We see it in the Quran so that we are not in it in the hereafter. And that's for us to actually take note of these things and to do the things that would cause us to be amongst those that are celebrating and celebrated on the day of judgment. There were just a few reflections that I, I would share from both of your beautiful reflections. Uh, the first one is that hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu on the power of tomorrow. Hadith Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it's narrated in Ibn Majah and other places where the Prophet Sallallahu gave him three advices. He said that when you stand up to pray, fasalli salatan muadda, that you pray as if it is your last prayer. Wala takallam bi kalam ta'tadhiru minhu ghaddan, and don't say things today that you'll have to apologize for tomorrow. And lose hope in what other people uh, have uh, accumulated, have uh, gathered in this world. And what that means is pray as if it's your last prayer. If you think about what distracts you, usually in your prayer, you're thinking about what comes after the prayer. And you need to think about this as the prayer today for the akhirah tomorrow, that you're here after tomorrow, this is your last prayer. So freeze yourself in the moment. Don't think you know, about the things that come after the prayer or that you expect to come after the prayer in the worldly sense. It's not there. So there is no tomorrow with your prayer. This is your last prayer. And don't say things today that you'll have to apologize for tomorrow. That's life advice. Like how many arguments do you have and you try to say the most hurtful thing possible because you, you know, well, tomorrow I'll be able to fix this. And there is no tomorrow. You know, someone dies in a tragic car accident or a sudden heart attack or uh, something happens to where there is no conversation to follow up after that one, or the scars that are left from that conversation, from that dispute, are too deep to ever really be dealt with in this world. So don't try to say the most hurtful thing. Don't go to bed angry. Don't say things today that you'll have to say sorry for tomorrow, because you might not get to say sorry in this world. And then lose hope in what other people have. You know, a lot of people uh, are, are distracted by this world because of what they have not yet accumulated of this world. And so I'm too busy trying to get that house and too, too busy trying to get that car and too busy trying to have this much money and too busy trying to have this much glamour and accumulate this and accumulate that. And then the abundance of this world completely uh, is, rendered, is, is rendered entirely useless once you go to your grave. Right? So all of it has to do with your relationship with Allah, your relationship with the people, your relationship with possessions of this world, things of this world. All have to do with this understanding of Look at what you have put forth for the inevitable tomorrow, which is the hereafter. And subhanAllah, at the end of the surah, which is uh, Surah Al-Hashr, uh, Allah Azza wa has these beautiful verses about His names. And the way it starts off, Allah glorifies His knowledge of the heavens and the earth. And then at the end of that sequence, يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Everything in the heavens and the earth glorifies Him in ways that human beings cannot understand. So it's only Allah that knows everything of the heavens and the earth, that which is seen and unseen, major and minor, concealed or made public. And everything in the heavens and the earth glorifies Allah in some way. 
So, فَكُنْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ yeah, Be amongst those that are prostrating to Allah. Be amongst those that are doing tasbih of Allah, that are glorifying and praising Allah. And finally, Allah says in, in, you know, in, in many parts of the Qur'an, uh, this idea of everything disappearing. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ Everything in this earth disappears. وَيَقْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذِي الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ And that idea of only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, being, uh, at one point, the only being, being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and everything else wiped out. You know, many of the ulama mentioned uh, that, that one of the benefits of that ayah is that the only thing that stays, yabqa, the only thing that stays, other than, of course, Allah himself, is what was done for Allah sincerely. Everything else becomes useless, meaningless, ceases to exist except for accountability for it, except for the deeds that were done solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking His reward. Those stay. And that's where you have that accumulation of what you prepared today, tomorrow. So it's muhasaba and being more mindful of what you've put forth in terms of evil, but also uh, being more patient with what you've put forth of good, that it will stay and that it will come back in the night time. So Zakmullah Khairan, dear Mashaykh, that was, uh, I think, very beneficial for all of us. And uh, I know it was longer today. I hope all of you appreciate, though, uh, you know, the, the various aspects and elements of this. And I want to hand it off to uh, Dr. Tahir, if you could sort of give us the final word on this all, inshallah, the subject all, inshallah, and then we'll uh, send people off, inshallah. Sheikh Tahir, we can't hear you. I'll try to wrap up something very important right now uh, to connect with what you said to what uh, Sheikh Abdullah was mentioning. And that is the, the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I'm just going to translate the meaning, that those thoughts that you had about Allah, that dhan that you had about Allah is what led to your destruction, right? So it is very important uh, when, we, when we see that, that we have the proper belief about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about his names and his attributes. And so again, when you look at the end of Surah Al-Hashr, and you see Allah Azza wa Jal introducing himself to his servants, um, letting us wow. know who he is. Because if we know who he is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we will love him. Know, to know him is to love him, right? And we will love him, yes. subhanahu wa ta'ala. That will be the catalyst for us doing these, that which pleases him. And we'll hope that he accepts those deeds from us. And we'll fear that we may not have done enough to please him. And so... Those are the arkan of ibadah, right? Those are the pillars of worship, the love of Allah, hope in his reward, and fearing his punishment. And all of that stems from that true preparation uh, for the hereafter. Uh, again, if there's one last thing that I could say, because it's not something that we focused on uh, in this particular thing, in this particular talk, but it is, the, it is the importance of managing one's thoughts. So even taking muhasaba of what you think about and not just what you do, because every action starts with a thought. Every good action starts with you thinking about doing something and every evil action is the same way. And if you learn to control your thoughts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you to do muhasaba of the way you think, then that will ultimately lead to a better muhasaba of your deeds because you'll stop a lot of the evil uh, things in their tracks. You won't even allow it to become more than a fleeting thought. And so you don't allow that fleeting thought to circle around and swim around in your head until it becomes a desire and that desire becomes a firm determination and then that turns into action. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to make us from amongst the righteous and make us from amongst those who are constantly aware of him subhanahu wa ta'ala and who constantly examine ourselves. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Zakallah khair, Dr. Tahir. And um, you know, to remind everyone inshallah, uh, tomorrow night, inshallah ta'ala, we'll have Quranic themes. So please make sure that you follow that on the Yaqeen platforms, inshallah ta'ala. And we'll continue to do this every night, Monday through Friday, inshallah, uh, for the month of June, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, of keeping connected with the Quran. Uh, tonight was a long one, but I personally found it very beneficial. So uh, we appreciate everything. And we'll try to post, uh, actually, the framework of Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, summarize. We'll try to post that, inshallah ta'ala, uh, on, our, on our social media platforms, bi'ithnillah. And Dr. Tahir is uh, working on systematic theology, so a lot of that is the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's coming out of the team that you're directing, and we just actually had Al-Halim. And so inshallah ta'ala, we'll, we'll continue to see uh, those, those, that introduction to Allah's names and attributes in a way that's beneficial to us through the work of 
uh, the systematic theology uh, framework that you all are working on. So, Jazakallah khairan. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته